The face of the AIDS epidemic in Canada is changing. Most people think this disease is just in the gay community or a problem with drug users and prostitutes. However, this disease has no barriers when it comes to who it affects. No one is immune. 45,000 Canadians have contracted the HIV virus, while more than 14,500 full-blown AIDS cases have been reported in Canada alone. If you think this is someone else's problem, think again. Although there is a great deal of discrimination towards AIDS victims, there are support groups and organizations committed to helping people with HIV and AIDS. One of these organizations is Teresa Group. I'm Annette and I'm a social worker at the Ter Teresa Group who works with children and families affected by HIV and AIDS. HIV and AIDS affects children and families in a way which most people don't recognize. We're here today at the Teresa Group and I'm interviewing a member named Sandra. That's not her real name, but we gotta use that in order to keep her identity a secret. When did you find out that you were first HIV positive and what made you wanna get tested? Um, well, I first found out I was HIV positive four years ago when I went to get tested at an anonymous testing clinic. Um, and uh, I uh, decided to go and get tested because I really started hearing that uh, HIV and AIDS was affecting women and was affecting basically everyone who um, was sexually active. My first reaction to finding out that I was HIV positive um, was, when am I going to die? I really felt that um, I only had about two years to live. I didn't know very much about HIV and AIDS. And the second question was, what about my child? And is he HIV positive? I can't show my face and I can't show my child's picture because I've, you know, I. I'm afraid that my child one day will be discriminated against. My child is actually four. He just turned four and um, he's not infected and after about three weeks of getting him tested um, at Sick Kids Hospital I uh, found out that um, he was fine and he was HIV negative and he was going to be fine. I have decided that I will eventually disclose to my child that um, I'm HIV positive and that his father is actually also HIV positive. Um, I have the benefit of having a lot of support in my family and um, I have decided that the best way to deal with this is to be honest with my child. Over and over again, we see children who are feeling isolated, alone, have no one to talk to. And one of the reasons is that people outside just don't understand. Do you feel isolated in any way? Um, again, because I have had a lot of support, um, I've been fortunate enough not to be turned away by my family and by my friends. Um, I know of many cases and many families and, and uh, many people who have lost close members of their families and, or friends because they found out that they were HIV positive. At first, for the first month, I felt very isolated and I felt that I was the only one that, only woman that could be HIV positive until I started finding out that a lot of women are getting HIV um, and a, a lot of families and children and normal people get HIV. I, uh, 
received a newsletter, and in the newsletter there was some information about the Teresa Group, and uh, it's, it made clear that the Teresa Group was an organization that was there for families and children living with HIV, and um, I automatically felt that uh, it was an organization that I could go to because they, you know, could understand my issues and could understand that, you know, my child was, even though he wasn't infected, he was also, he was affected. I don't know. It's a, it's a hard question to answer, but I know that since I love that person and that person loves me, you can't just ruin a relationship. Like so many people that say, oh, I'm going to be there for you and all that. But when it comes down to it, when they die, it's by themselves. It would be really devastating for me to know that my closest friend is sick and is just about to die. But definitely I believe in supporting them, she or he. Um, I'm not going to lose his friendship, but, you know, I got to be there. That's why, that's why it's, that's called friendship. But I don't know why. I don't know how I react because it never, never happened to me, but I'll try to be there. I don't know. I wouldn't treat them any different or, you know, some people, they wouldn't really be around them that much. I would treat them, I believe I would treat them the same way. My hopes for the future are definitely that one day I can do an interview and not have to hide my identity and not have to hide my child's identity. One of the main things I think that's important to, to state is that to really, even though HIV and AIDS is not their issue at the present time, it can be their issue very easily. Um, and uh, to really be educated on the issue, to really, you know, uh, know about HIV and AIDS and how it's uh, contracted and uh, who's at risk, and also know that, you know, um, they, you know, should be educated enough to know that by shaking someone's hand who's HIV positive, they're not going to get it, or, you know, by being someone's friend, they're not going to get it. Um, and just educating themselves, I think, is the best thing, and, and education can prevent this from happening to them also. And uh, the whole idea of either abstaining from sex or being as open and knowledgeable as possible about HIV and AIDS and all the issues that come along with it. Oh, grade five, as soon as possible. Probably around maybe 13, 12, that would be what I would think, because that's how old I was educated. Well, I have three daughters. Uh, one, are, one, the oldest one is seven. And we're starting to talk about it now. It's thing. It's it's discussed more now in homes, uh, like any other disease, like cancer, like diabetes, like. And it should be discussed at a very young age. Sandra, thanks a lot for your time, and you've really been helpful. And my best wishes go out to you and your child as well. So good luck in the future. Another organization committed to helping people with HIV and AIDS is the Canadian Actors' Equity through their campaign, Equity Fights AIDS. Equity Fights AIDS raises money specifically for uh, people living with AIDS or their relatives, anybody having to do with that, to help them uh, cover expenses. And uh, what we do is have theaters across Canada. We're really good with this. I mean, they are, they back us really well. Uh, what they allow us to do is to go in for a week. And at the end of the show, uh, the, after the bows of the cast, one of the members of the cast comes out and gives a speech, uh, this speech here. And it just sort of tells the audience what it's about. It says, this is Equity Fights AIDS Week. It tells them about the Actors Fund and how this money is needed because we don't get, uh, actors do not get, as I said, unemployment insurance or other help. 
Then we have um, volunteers who go out to all the exits. They stand at the exits with buckets, and people just come and put their money in. Like loonies and toonies are fabulous. And uh, I mean, some nights one shows will make uh, they might make two thousand dollars, depending on maybe Phantom or um, uh, Crazy If You Did Really Well. Theater sometimes will have a particular night that all the proceeds of the audience coming in will go to the actors' fund. And there are people who um, leave uh, money in their will. I mean, there are actors now who will have um, donations to the actors' fund taken off their weekly paycheck. There's many, many ways of doing it. Um, we're just starting now. Somebody, people are writing books about the theater people, and they want the money to go to the actors' fund. So there's different ways. I mean, we always have to keep finding new ways because of all the cutbacks. People, everybody's asking for money, so uh, we have to find new ways of doing it. But we try to give something back for whatever they're giving us. We're here at the Canadian stage. We've just viewed Angels in America, and. The viewers are making donations for the Equity Fights AIDS. So, Natalia, how did the donations go so far? Oh, well, it's going really well. You could just hear all the money inside. Thank you very much. Everybody's been giving a lot. I guess the performance really helped bring awareness to the situation, and everybody just wants to help afterwards. Hi, I'm Steve Cummins, and I play Prior Walter in Angels in America. And I'm Kevin Bundy, and I played the character of Joe Pitt. Kevin, how has this play personally affected you? Um, well, it's made me more um, aware of the issues of AIDS. Um, in terms of my character, um, it, it's made me more aware of, um, well, all kinds of things. Um, religiously, because I play a Mormon who is an extremely strict religious person. Um, but also, um, I've known people who have had AIDS and... Um, it's it's just it's touched me um a lot um the, with the characters and the story the it's the the fight uh one person's fight against his illness um and that that strength that has really spoken to me and that it can happen to a lot of us it has a huge demands on everybody physically and uh and emotionally because the issues are so uh, well, very poignant today. I mean, AIDS is still a very real disease. It's still amongst us and rising amongst young people, especially. And it's really important to, you know, to keep the level of education and awareness out there very high. And I think that um, that's our job, I think, in this play. It's, it behooves us all to keep informed. Have you guys noticed um, a large number of young people who have been coming to the play, or has this mostly been like a certain age group that has been in the audience? Yes, um, a lot of, of young people in there, and young people tend to be uh, a better kind of audience, I find, because they're, they're uh, less inhibited, uh, it's just when they're in groups. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're not afraid to, to really react and respond and... and uh, uh, go with the story. The way the play is set up, it's set up in a very uh, soap opera style. So, but, but the issues are still very large. So you can follow the story and it strings you along and then bam, it hits you with uh, a, a very uh, heavy emotional impact because you fall in love with these characters. And, and so young people especially are, are, are quite moved by this. And, and I, I feel the awareness level rising. Everybody says it's a gay-related disease. Well, it isn't. I mean, yeah. It isn't at all. Um, it's affecting everybody. We've had families come to the Actors Fund where the, the mother uh, contacted AIDS, and, and then the father had it and the two children. And uh, We're trying to make people aware that there is a necessity for a universal understanding of what's happening with this. Um, there was a few years ago, I was uh, doing some collecting at a, at a theater, and uh, they were doing really well until the two men walked by and the one said, uh, I said, um, well, I mean, yes, we know they're sick and there are like problems, but this is the theater is no place to tell us about it. Yeah, but that attitude is changing a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, even now, because there is this new, uh, all this new medication coming out, they say that it's going to be really, it's a miracle drug. Well, it's very good. This cocktail is very good. However, it costs an enormous amount of money and it doesn't work for everybody. 
and we just don't want people to, to let it go in the background and be, what's it called, donor weary about it. So it's the awareness level that we're trying to do more than anything else with this. I think that hopefully the stereotypes will diminish. I don't think they'll ever all go away. Yeah. I mean, that's human nature. You can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, on a wider scale, at least to have more understanding from people. Okay, do you have any tips or suggestions to give to those young people who are not really as educated and just think that it's a gay-related disease? I wish I really had the full answer to that. I mean, um, younger people have to hear from other younger people. They're not going to go for what mm -hmm. all the people are saying. Like, programs like this is... Our, fabulous it's wonderful uh, it's just if the younger people would get a really good feeling self-esteem about themselves respect themselves enough I think they would begin to understand that uh, this is a disease that's going to kill you and you may never reach to be 25 I've had a few friends I know who were like 18 and they're gone is a hospice created as an alternative to hospital care for people in the late stages of AIDS. Casey House is a hospice and the environment here is uh, is home-like as as home-like as possible. It's um, differing from the hospital, whereas there's many people on many wards with many similar illnesses. Here, the similar condition is HIV and AIDS, palliative care. Well, this is the quiet room, and this is used for residents and for family. And um, it's a very uh, personable room, and that people come here to be quiet and to reflect. Hi, my name's uh, Rod Machano, Shining Thunderbird Eagle Man. Um, I'm from Heron Bay. I had AIDS uh, since um, 1989. That's eight years ago, but they figured that I had it two years prior. Um, so that'd make me 10 years. I had uh, 10 really good friends who, um, God rest their soul, are gone to the spirit world where I'm one of the last two survivors of this deadly disease called AIDS. When I first uh, moved into the Casey house, I guess um, my uh, feelings were that I was here to um, prepare myself to uh, pass on to the spirit world and uh, you know and I was uh, writing letters to my family and uh, they were basically goodbye letters and I was writing uh, things about how I felt and what my life was all about and where it, where it came where it came from and like from my childhood right up to when I got to the Casey house. Well, when I left here in uh, June, I was, um, I guess uh, you could say I was severely depressed, but I went back home and um, I uh, tried to live on my own and with the home care and everything and uh, the home hospice from Casey House and uh, plus with um, uh, home care, the VON and St. Elizabeth's and I just couldn't come out of my depression. Ignorance is one of the biggest problems with people living with AIDS and HIV because they don't take the time out to learn where people are dying and they don't care. Is that human nature? I don't think so. I think that's just plain ignorance and uh, 
I'm a big believer in what goes around and comes around. You know, like if you don't live good, you're not going to have a good life. I had to uh, make a choice if I was going to live or die. Rod was admitted um, in the winter uh, to Casey House and we're assigned primary residence um, when the person is admitted. And I thought this is going to be quite a challenging experience. Culturally, it would be a very vibrant experience. And I thought, okay, how can I fit in to this? And I'm going to have to learn step by step how to um, be of a help. The people that I'm preparing food for are, um, are sick, yeah. basically. Um, what we are is a palliative care facility. Well, tonight I'm making, I'm actually making two things. Um, I'm starting with a vegetable casserole that I'm doing here, which is, um, it's sort of, it ends up being a multi-purpose dish here at the house. Um, what it does is it addresses the um, vegetarians that are currently in the house. It can be a side dish for the meat eaters. And the other nice thing about this dish is that um, I cook it to the point where um, it's soft enough that it can be pureeable for the people that are on soft diets. Oh. Um, and I can also add a bit of chicken broth to it, and, and it makes it a bit thinner so that it can be a soup. So it ends up being a multi-purpose dish. And the other thing that I'm doing is preparing a soup for tomorrow's lunch. People who arrive at Casey House are, have, are in a journey in their disease where they've reached the point where, where nutrition is really not, not paramount or not key to for life-sustaining reasons. Um, so... Nutrition, I wouldn't say, is probably the, is the most important thing to be looking after. It's more, um, food becomes more of a psychological need here, I would say, more than anything else. Um, people still enjoy food, people still enjoy the taste of food, the sensation of eating, the comfort that eating brings them. In this facility, or, or in this circumstance, we would have people here who um, are clearly near death, and so food is no longer a requirement. My name is Diane McGuire. I'm the massage and aromatherapist at Casey, Out Casey House Hospice. At Casey House, we use massage and aromatherapy to help people deal with some of their physiological problems and for also some of the emotional components that uh, people are dealing with. In the massage treatment, I use essential oils. So each treatment has a unique flavor in the sense that the aromatherapy oils are chosen for specific conditions. My name is Susan Portner and I'm the coordinator of the volunteer program. Um, I've been doing this now for four years and I was a volunteer here before that for six years. Uh, I manage, my role is to manage the volunteers um, but not in a, in a managerial sense, more in a nurturing, supportive way. Uh, I train and select and recruit all of the volunteers that are here. They go through a very extensive program um, to be volunteers because in a place like this, it, it's not just sort of coming and being here. You really need to be present for the people that live here. I'm Judy Zelig. I'm a social worker, primarily in the Casey House Home Hospice Program. And I similarly provide services to clients and families dealing with issues of grief and loss and families and dealing with a life-threatening illness, chronic illness, which is so difficult, and helping the client and family through that journey. The message, I guess, would be, um, if you do have it, live it one day at a time. Live with hope and live with harmony. For people only have one day, like, take it one hour, take it one minute, but live and let live. I guess the worst part about being here was uh, when I lost the first person that um, I got close to. His name is Rodney and um, he passed away um, about a month ago. It's like you promised me that we were going to go shopping, we were going to go bike riding and you let me down. And this is Rodney's shirt. Um, one of the nurses here got it for me. And, you know, like, um, I still miss him. Rodney was his name, and 
basically, um, I, I, I was um, t t told that he was um, just, just resting and, uh, and when he um, passed away, I, um, I didn't know what to do because we talked about um, doing a lot of different, different things, uh, <clears throat> different things together and, um, you know, he lived in the area and um, it was like, I didn't know he was gone and they told me he was gone and it was like, my life was, I didn't know what to do and if it wasn't for Jim and all the rest of the staff that really cared. <laughs> One of the points I really wanted to make was that really um, hurt me was uh, there's a community about 15 minutes away from where I'm from, and I'm from the PIC 50 uh, First Nations Reserve. Uh, well, it's not called a reserve anymore, it's a community, but uh, there's a town about 15 minutes away, and just recently, I found out that there were uh, three people tested HIV positive, and apparently uh, two of them were uh, pregnant. I really believe this uh, message has to get out to every single person, no matter if you're young or old, because that's the only way we're going to stop it. Thank you.